Hello and welcome to this Tornado Outbreak short summary. This video is going to be going over the significant yet at the same time not so much, but we'll get into that in just a little bit here. Uh, 1994 Palm Sunday Tornado Outbreak. This outbreak mainly occurred on the 27th of March of, well, 1994. As always, starting with the grand overview of this event, we would see a pretty large, uh, compared to um, how high risks are issued nowadays, uh, high risk for much of the deep south states, so that being Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, as well as North and South Carolina. No, I do not consider those deep south states, but still they, they are just further south, I'll say it that way. <laughs> We also see up here in the top right a significant amount of much longer track tornadoes that coincide very nicely and obviously with our tornado reports so that just a singular tornado report does not mean an individual tornado. Note how we had, I believe, that this green dye out in Texas here is a, uh, is a wind report. I might just be wrong on that. So don't take that. I know red is tornado, and that's all that we're caring about for now. But let's get situated. It's the 27th of March, 1994. I am not even a thought at this point since I was born in 2001. Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi on this day are seeing temperatures up into the 70s uh, Fahrenheit. However, dew points are in the upper 60s with... Temperatures around the low to mid 70s and dew points pretty low to the, sorry, pretty close to the air temperature. That is something that we already want to look out for as the around the upper 60s points for the dew points is already a lookout by itself as well. In the early day, in the very early day, the first sounding I believe that was done uh, for, I believe it was um, Huntsville, NWS, although I could be wrong about that, I do apologize if I am, uh, detected convective available potential energy, CAPE in short, of 1,200 joules per kilogram, which is already plenty for supercells to form, as they only need around 1,000 to 1,500, so it's a little bit on the lower end, but still. And this would be nearly double by the time the outbreak is beginning, which was around uh, middle of the morning. So not too far away from the first sound, sounding of the 1200 uh, cape that we saw. The first tornado watch for the day would be issued at uh, 1018 Eastern, 918 Central. The first of the tornado warnings would be issued around 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the there's a, there would actually be a PDS, stands for Particularly Dangerous Situation, tornado watch that was issued for Georgia, which I unfortunately could not find a picture of um, what this what this watch looked like, unfortunately but was issued at uh, noon Eastern. We would have only 29 tornadoes from this event. However, nine out of the 29 were intense, meaning F3 and above. This is a quite large amount of intense tornadoes compared to the total number that we saw. Um, which is why I say that this event is notable, but at the same time not notable, because on the surface it's just 29 tornadoes, but you see that almost if we had 30 and there was 10 in 10, so that would be 1 in 3, so it's just under the 1 in 3 mark there, which is a, which is a quite high uh, ratio for that. I digress. Note that in 2005 US dollars specifically, $140 million in damage was caused from this event. This event would also kill 40 and injure just under 
500 people. Our first tornado is, if I'm not mistaken, our most notable from this event. This tornado went from the south-southwest of Ragland, Alabama, all the way to the northeast of Rock Run, Alabama. This F4, which I believe is called the Rock Run F4, although I think I'm mistaken on that, I apologize if I am, uh, tore a path that was 80 kilometers long, would cause 22 deaths, most of them in a singular uh, church, unfortunately. This tornado would also cause 150 injuries, as well as $50.5 million in damage. This tornado, as um, we will see throughout all of our notables, had a very fast forward speed because the storm it was attached to also had a very fast forward speed that of anywhere from 40 to 60, although more in the realm of 45 to 55 miles per hour which is that that's pretty much highway speeds and very dangerous as you can imagine this tornado would not only destroy three houses of worship i believe all three of them being churches actually um which were if i'm not mistaken all three of them were in session which makes it even worse of course but destroyed 18 homes as well as an additional 20 mobile homes this tornado's most destructive bits were destroying the churches that were in service. And if I'm not mistaken, our two damaged photos here are from the same house of worship. This tornado would dissipate as it was nearing the Alabama-Georgia state line. Our second notable here, we have a total of six, by the way. Uh, but this second notable one went from the southeast of Rome, Georgia, to the east-southeast of Jasper, Georgia. This tornado was also an F4 and also tracked 80 kilometers and had a path that was 1.6 kilometers wide, which, translating into feet, is a mile wide. This tornado would cause three deaths as well as an estimated around 7 million dollars in damage this tornado as i mentioned that we'll see throughout all of our notables had a very fast forward speed that's being around 40 to 50 miles per hour and would apparently at f0 strength uproot large pines and oaks although i doubt that an f0 would do that although it does depend on how soft the soil is but I digress. This tornado would reach F4 in rural Cherokee County, Georgia, where it would then strike the community of Cleveland at F4 strength. However, I managed to not find any photos from this tornado. This tornado would only reach, sorry, this tornado was um, only 0.38 miles, which I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Apologies for all the errors, is around 0.4 kilometers, 0.6, something like that, 0.5. Uh, my my in-head calculations are not very good. <laughs> what I do know is that this tornado would dissipate just 8 kilometers away from Jasper, so thankfully is sparing the town. Our third notable once again in Georgia, went from the north-northwest of Dawsonville to the north-northeast of Clarksville, Georgia. This tornado was yet another long track tornado, having a path 72 kilometers long. This tornado also caused three deaths, and just in property damage alone, caused 17 million in damage. That was a that was the only definitive uh, dollar in damage amounts that I was able to find because others did vary a fair bit. So I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> Sorry. This tornado would strengthen to F2 upon reaching the unfortunately hilariously named Lumpkin County. Yes, I'm making fun of it, but in the funny, but in the haha -ha funny way, I did not know that Georgia had a county called Lumpkin, but Lumpkin County is a county that exists 
thank you, Georgia, for uh, blessing my day when I found that out. <laughs> in Lompkin County, there is a Dalonega, if I remember correctly, and this tornado would only pass within 2,400 meters to the north of Dalonega, which is around, what, like close to three miles, something like that. Again, my in-head calculations for distance are horrible. I apologize about that. Now, this tornado would finally reach its F3 peak upon, uh, on, sorry, on the northwest face of Yona Mountain. And it would also be here that this tornado reached a very impressive two kilometers wide, that, which is almost the distance that it missed Dalonega by. It is crazy to think that a tornado can be 2,000 meters wide. This tornado, though, would go on to dissipate just under 10 kilometers to the north of Clarksville, thankfully sparing the town, and it did so by that I mean lifted at 3.02.15.02 uh, Eastern Standard Time. This tornado had a ground time of just over an hour, which again is crazy to think that a tornado can be on the ground for a whole hour, and we have seen even longer track tornadoes. It's, it's Long track tornadoes are crazy, y'all. <laughs> just like this next one as well. This tornado, also an F3, went to the south of Adairsville, to the northeast of Jasper. This tornado tracked an impressive 64 kilometers, would unfortunately cause the deaths of nine people, and cause ten and a quarter million dollars in damage. Yet again, we have a fast mover, and... The reports from multiple eyewitnesses were that it looked like a fast-moving fog bank, uh, which, by the way, some eyewitnesses of the Tri-State Tornado reports that tornado looking like a fast-moving fog bank, so that should kind of bring in mind just how fast this tornado was. Granted, this thing wasn't moving at 60 to 70 miles per hour. It's moving at around 40 to 50, but don't get me wrong. That's still very fast. This tornado would rapidly reach F3 as it was about to hit Pleasant Valley, and then of course hit Pleasant Valley at F3 strength, where it would throw a 4,000 pound, which is around 1,800 kilogram truck, 275 meters, which is around 300 yards. This tornado would go on to keep its F3 strength for a fair bit, and would do so as it hits the community of Funkhauser. Finally, this tornado would reach 2.4 kilometers wide in Pickens County before it relatively soon after that dissipated. Note that an F2 would overlap the path of this tornado only 30 minutes later, which is... Not the best, obviously. Right after a tornado, usually people come out and start investigating. We've seen this happen with the second of the Tanner uh, F5s from the 74 Super, um, as well as a few other notables. But the F2, as far as I know, did not cause any more casualties, very thankfully. One of our last notables here, folks, this went from Tallulah Falls, Georgia, to Walhalla, South Carolina. This F3 would track a, another impressive 48 kilometers, and as far as it could find, did not cause any casualties, which is a very good thing. This tornado would only damage around five homes in Tallulah Falls. However, what makes this tornado most notable is that it dropped off a 300-foot cliff, that is 152 meters, and survived. Now, the myth that a tornado cannot cross steep terrain is to a point correct, as dropping off a cliff mo is most likely going to weaken it, weaken a tornado at least. However, this was not the case. The tornado would actually intensify after this. 
um, and we will see that in just a second. But in Oconee County, South Carolina, this tornado would destroy 60 homes. It was determined by the surveyors of this path that this tornado was F2 in Georgia and F3 in South Carolina. Now, the dropping off the cliff part did have has nothing to do with the strengthening of the tornado. It's just that it just became F3 in South Carolina. Most notably, a lot of these tornadoes have been parts of the Piedmont, Alabama tornado family, which was our first tornado that we talked about, the F4. And I bring this up because uh, debris from Piedmont, such as smaller debris like photos and documents, were actually found in South Carolina because of this tornado, which is an extremely... Uh, that, that that's a whole state away that, that's ex that is absolutely mind-blowing that is extremely extremely impressive that I, I know a photo barely weighs anything but for something to stay in the air that long is impressive our last notable here folks went from northeast of Inman South Carolina to High Shoals North Carolina this F2 would attract a yet another impressive long track tornado being that of 72 kilometers. And as far as I know, this one as well did thankfully not cause any casualties, which we will see why that is such a good thing in just a second here. Do note that this um, the survey of this tornado is a little weird as I couldn't find definitive proof that this tornado was F2 in South Carolina, but all damage that is recorded is indicative of it being F2, as before crossing into North Carolina, this tornado had already downed three metal truss transmission towers. So going into North Carolina, we have verified F2 damage as it would down another three tr metal truss transmission towers, and then at another location, another three metal truss transmission towers for a total of nine if you're keeping track. And as well, just to add to the list to make it double digits, a single cinder block structure was also ripped apart. I say that this tornado very thankfully didn't cause any casualties because this tornado struck Gardner Webb University as well as downtown Boiling Springs. Colleges obviously are where a lot of people are. Uh, colleges are just a little densely populated with all of the dorms and teachers and whatnot, you know. So to be honest, you kind of expect at least one or two injuries when a tornado strikes a university, but there was none, which again, very thankful for that. This tornado would keep its F2 intensity as it struck the community of Shelby in North Carolina and spared the town of Sherryville by just under five kilometers to its south. Upon after crossing North Carolina Highway number 279, this tornado would soon after that dissipate. This tornado outbreak is obviously not the most intense outbreak ever, but it is still a pretty notable one to happen on Palm Sunday. Uh, but before we get into that, a little more detail is that every single notable, in fact, nearly every single tornado on this uh, on the Wikipedia page, which should be confirmed at least, uh, would all destroy uh, the mixed construction homes of brick and wood uh, homes specifically. Uh, this is a very very common way to build homes in the United States, so there's nothing wrong if not expected for a tornado to destroy especially something like an f3 or 4 to destroy some homes if it, it does hit a community at least which i'm not rooting for at all it's a bad thing that they did this bad tornadoes are bad bad tornadoes are bad but cool looking at the same time but they're still bad they're bad okay so destroying homes is bad tornadoes are arsonists <laughs> Sorry. 
Note that our uh, Daresville F3 is actually the second deadliest of the events, and to this day, I believe, is still one of the deadliest tornadoes in, I believe it was Georgia that a Daresville is in. I apologize if I got the state wrong, because I have already forgot where I said a Daresville was. <laughs> like I mentioned uh, with uh, the beginning here, uh, this is the one of the notable Palm Sunday outbreaks. There are uh, three so far to happen in the United States, and this one is like the third most notable, uh, with obviously the most notable being from 1965, and that one doing a hell of a lot for civil defense. However, at this point, civil defense has improved by a lot. However, we'll still see some deficiencies in just a second here. However, I do want to mention a very, very big thing that this outbreak did. It proved through a trial of fire the WSR-88. This is, to this day, the main Doppler radar used by all WF, uh, WFO offices. I just said weather forecasting offices offices. <laughs> Before this, it was the WSR-57. The 57 and 88, meaning the years that they were developed. Uh, the WSR-57 caught the first uh, hook echoes in 57, actually, in Champaign, Illinois, which is pretty cool. That's not too far away from where I am, as I am just in Illinois. Um, and the 88 is obviously an improvement of this, and we have continued to improve the WSR-88 into the 88D, I think. Yeah, um, again, still being used today. This is an insanely good radar, and aside from spotters, is the main way that the NWS detects storms. Um, it is, again, it is, it is used by every single WFO, and it was only very recently at the time, in 94, um, just given to the NWS offices that were affected by this outbreak. I think that even one office had their 88 go down and then had to rely on their uh, 57, which was still operating. Um, and that one was, yes, obviously worse, but still able to function. But the key takeaway here is that this proved just how much better the WSR-88 is. And again, once again, still used to this day. What I mean by the deficiency that I stated is that there was a deficiency in the number of NWS weather radios in around the Deep South region, or just in the South, where this uh, tornado outbreak affected. Not saying anything bad about the people there, not saying that they went not saying that they don't pay attention to weather. If you're in the Deep South, you need to be paying attention to weather all the time. Or just if you're anywhere between the Rockies and the Appalachians. What the NWS found was that there was a lack of households that had an NWS weather radio. And so a push was given to really get households all across the nation to have an NWS radio. And it's worked immensely. How do I know? Um, duh, it's because I have one. That's how it's worked. Just kidding. Um, I just love weather, and um, just being aware of weather is very good for you. So if you don't have a weather radio, then you should definitely get one. So do it. You don't have to, though. However, though, that is all that I have for this shorter, this short summary ended up being a little bit of a longer one, but I still hope that you all enjoyed this video and learned something from it, and I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all so much for watching.